If you don't know your rights, functionally, you don't have any. Hola amigos. If you don't know any Spanish, it's uh, hello my friends. <laughs> I'm holding something here that many of you saw when you were in junior high or high school. But I'm sure that after that, these books were put away and some of us don't remember much about the Constitution of the United States unless somebody on the television or on the radio mentioned something about it. I have with me uh, Steve Noble. He'll tell you a little bit about him. <laughs> uh, but uh, he has his own radio show. And I'm here because I want to ask him questions about the Constitution. Things that are important to me, and I hope that are important to you. So, let me introduce Steve Noble. Aren't you technically with me since we're in my studio? <laughs> you know, you're right. Huh? <laughs> but since I'm doing the show... Yes, you're the boss. <laughs> That's rare that I'm going to sit here in my own studio and not ask and the question. And be interviewed. <laughs> but that's fine. I'm happy to help. What do you want to know? You want to know my... my well, let's, let's start with <clears throat> this. Let's start with why was the Declaration of Independence written and why was the Constitution of the United States written? Yeah, written at totally different periods of time. Declaration of Independence written in 1776. Uh, mostly by Jefferson... Uh, by default, he actually didn't want to write it, but the it was called the Committee of Five, on which John Adams was one of the members, but and uh, Franklin, and and so they kind of forced him because he was the best writer. So Jefferson spent 17 days writing the Declaration of Independence. That's it. That's it. 17 days. He spent about three or four days writing the guts of the Declaration of Independence, which is basically a laundry list of complaints. So I teach high school age homeschoolers. So this okay. is my, 10th year teaching high school age homeschoolers civics. And I tell them, how long would it take you to come up with a list of 20 or 30 complaints about your parents? And they're all like, I could do that pretty quick. I said, okay, exa that, exactly. That's what, <laughs> that's why Jefferson was able to crank out that list of complaints. But it took him the rest of the time, almost two weeks to write the beginning and the end. Uh, essentially, in effect, the Declaration of Independence is a, is a divorce letter, but it's also a creed. So we're the only nation in the history of the world that was founded on a creed. Like, who are you guys, and what do you stand for? What do you actually believe in? That's the beginning, which you were talking about with your favorite word, inalienable rights. Uh, don't ask me to do it again. <laughs> endowed by their creator, by the way, capital C, creator. Endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Chief among them being life, uh, liberty, liberty, and the, the pursuit, pursuit of, of happiness. happiness. By the way, that's not the guarantee of happiness, but it's a chance to pursue happiness. Mm -hmm. um, so the Declaration of Independence is fascinating. A lot of people will look back and try to over-Christianize the founding of the nation. As if every one of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence was a biblical born-again Christian. We actually only know that about a few of them. But most of them, this is what's interesting, most of them were very conversant in the Bible, had very strong theology, they all believe in God as creator and sovereign. They believe that, like Jefferson, who didn't believe Jesus was God. He didn't believe in the miracles. He didn't believe Jesus was born of a virgin. He didn't believe that Jesus was resurrected. But he did believe that Jesus was the greatest moral his teacher in the history of the world. Well, wait a minute. I just learned something. I personally did not know that yeah. background history of Jefferson. So most people will say Jefferson was a Christian. So uh, for me to understand it, it's, repeat that again. For okay. Me. Now let me help you out a little bit here. We don't have people like Thomas Jefferson anymore. We don't have somebody that's conversant in the Bible, knows theology, believes in God, not as a deist, meaning God just kind of creates everything, winds it up, and leaves for Tahiti and goes on vacation. Uh, but God is intimately aware of and involved in the affairs of men. Okay. However, he does not believe Jesus is the Son of God. Interesting. He would call himself a Christian. But just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't mean you are one. I can call yeah. myself a car. Poof! I didn't just become a car. So, even though Jefferson believed in God and had some 
in many ways, he was more of a Christian in his thinking than a lot of Americans today. But he wasn't what we would call a biblical Christian or what I would call a born-again Christian. Okay. Yeah. okay? So Jefferson, in trying to really encapsulate the, the thoughts and the beliefs of the American people at the time, which is why he didn't write the Declaration from his peculiar perspective. He wrote it to basically represent all the people in the nation. So mm-hmm. he paid attention to uh, the sermons. I have actually have two books. I don't have them sitting here. They're in the other room. I have two books that are nothing but sermons from the 1760s through 1790 in America by American pastors. Mm-hmm. So he knew what was important to Americans. He knew they had a Judeo-Christian ethic. He knew they believed in the sovereignty of God. He knew that they believed that God had uniquely positioned them in this country, uh, starting in 1620 down up at Plymouth, to, uh, to be a representative of his to a certain ex- extent as a nation. And his job in writing the Declaration was, let's declare who we are, and let's tell England, King George, why we want a divorce. As a, as, and as a matter of fact, we're not asking for one. We're doing Demanding it. it. <clears throat> and then he signs off at the end. So that's the Declaration of, of Independence, which had that purpose. And then the Constitution is like the rules of the road. So like Alina, who's filming us, when My she, favorite granddaughter. Right, your favorite <laughs> granddaughter. You're not supposed to say that. Papa, oh, you have two now. Uh, <laughs> you, you have two so now. So my she, oldest <laughs> favorite granddaughter. There you go. Well played. The damage is already done. Uh, <laughs> so when she went to get a driver's license, one of the things she had to learn was the rules of the road. How do I, what are the rules of driving around the area? Yeah. Uh, the Constitution is a document of governance. Right. A uh, political rules of the road. Uh, and if you printed it out, if you printed out the, the, the Constitution of the United States, uh, including the 27 amendments, which most people don't even know how many amendments there are, including the 27 amendments, it would be about 17 pages. Okay? It would be about seven. So it's not incredibly long. It doesn't cover every nook and cranny that could be covered. Uh, but it is, as one British prime minister said, the, he called it the greatest document ever written by mankind. And that was a British prime minister not that long after we declared our independence and won our independence. So it is an amazing document. It's amazing resilient. It, it's amazing resilience is unique in the world in terms of its ability to provide the rules of the road for what has arguably become the greatest nation, certainly the most powerful nation in the history of the world, with a 17-page document. That's pretty amazing in and of itself. It is. Um, and those are the rules of the world that every American should be aware of in, in general terms, you know. So when the Constitution, um, the Constitutional Congress that mm-hmm. met, right? In Second Continental Congress. Yeah. Second Continental Congress. Uh, remember, I'm not from the States. I, I came here when I was 14, so I had to catch up with a lot of this. Do you know what form of government we were under after the Revolutionary War? Oh, after the Revolutionary War? It wasn't that one. Uh, Well, we were not the United States of America at that time, were we? Well, technically we declared ourselves that. But we were under the Articles of Confederation. Okay. But that stopped working. It was falling apart. So that was between the states that got that together. That was after we won the Revolutionary this. War, but before what you referenced, which yeah. is the Second Continental Congress, which met in Philadelphia. Because during that time, which was 1789, during that time, that 20 years, the governance of the country was falling apart. It wasn't working. Mm-hmm. So we had to scrap the Articles of Confederation, which is what was first. And then they came back together in Washington, D.C. at the Second Continental Congress for the Constitutional Convention to write a new form of government that mm-hmm. had never been, mm-hmm. that never existed before then. And that's what they did in mm-hmm. 1789, mm-hmm. is wrote the Constitution. Right. What I want to focus on, um, Steve, uh, is on our constitutional rights. So, why don't you just take it from there? How many there are, well, what they are, <clears throat> And in your opening, you were referencing the First Amendment, which was the right to assembly. That's right. part of it. Freedom mm-hmm. of speech, freedom of the press, right to assembly. Uh, the uh, free exercise of religion, the Establishment Clause, as it's called. 
the amendments, some of the states would only ratify the Constitution if they actually added the Bill of Rights. One of the complaints about the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10, men, first 10 amendments of the U.S. Constitution, one of the complaints back then is that there weren't enough. So their thinking was, remember, you gotta, you gotta understand the historical context. They had come out from underneath the tyranny of Great Britain, where you had the king and a little bit of parliament. But Europe in general was all about the powerful. And so when they're writing the constitution and creating a, a federal government, they, they're well aware of their, of their propensity to create something that would turn into a Frankenstein or a monster. So they didn't want the federal government to be super powerful like the king and parliament had been in Great Britain, nor as powerful as kings and governments had been in Europe. So they were very concerned about how much power are we going to give this thing once we create it. It's like Frankenstein, right? So in the story of Frankenstein, the monster gets so powerful, it turns around, starts killing people, kills its uh, creator. So some of the states said, we're not signing anything until there's a Bill of Rights. Because we need to protect ourselves from this government we're about to create. So one of the complaints was, only 10? We definitely got to have more than just 10 rights. But they settled on 10. So on the 10. first 10 amendments is the Bill of Rights to protect us from our government. So like freedom of speech. Uh, right. We don't want the government to be able to come in and tell us what we can and cannot say. That's a hot button issue today with things like Twitter and Facebook, you on YouTube. I get banned on YouTube regularly because of the things that I talk about in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, so free speech was a big deal. The free exercise of religion, Christian, Jewish, Hinduism, whatever, or nothing. But the government can't impose on your right to practice your religion. It also can't make you practice a religion. And the federal government can't establish a, a religion. religion. Yeah. So that's just a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Freedom of the press. Why do we want freedom of the press? Because we want the press out there to hold the government accountable. Right. So everything's about checks and balances, mm -hmm. even in the three branches of government, because we're afraid that we just created this Leviathan and we don't want him to turn around and eat us. Right. And, you know, you just mentioned the three branches of, of government, and, and they were created, the way I understand it, from my point of view, to have checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So not one person had the whole power. Edmund, Edmund Burke said that all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. So in order to triumph over evil to a certain extent, you have to be enabled to fight it, right? But they also knew that James Madison said if men were angels, they would have no need of government. Mm. But we aren't. We're not. So our founding fathers knew, they understood the sin nature of mankind, that we are going to have a tendency to do the wrong thing. You've heard the phrase probably power corrupts and absolute power yeah, corrupts power absolutely. Corrupt. So nobody should be in, uh, given so much power because you know it's going to corrupt them to a certain extent and there's got to be a way to check them on that power. So for us, uh, when your wife was alive, she was a check on your power <laughs> and you were probably a check on hers. Maybe a little. My wife's definitely a check on my power but I'm a check on hers. <laughs> to a certain extent, our children who are now a little bit older are a check on us. When we say things, if they're inaccurate or unfair, they're gonna yeah. say something. We raise them to say something. You don't just sit there on the sidelines when there's an abuse of power. You stand up and you speak up. So there's a lot about the Constitution and our form of government that was put in place in order to protect us, me, you, Alina, right. the people from the government. Just, just to review for everybody, sure. uh, of the three form, I mean, the three branches of government. What is the powers that each of them have? Okay, we'll start with the executive branch. That's the president, right? It's the largest of the three branches, uh, by far. The executive branch is the largest because the executive branch's job is to implement the laws. Right. The laws come out of the legislative branch. Right. That's Congress, which is, which is only nine. So they people. passed. Well, that's the judicial branch. Oh, that's, that's our, the Supreme our, Court. That's all right. You see, that's why I need somebody go. like you. Which, by the way, you want to know why there's nine people on the U.S. Supreme Court? It's not because the Constitution says so. That's just tradition. This, the Constitution says nothing about how many people should be on the Supreme Court. Interesting little factoid. That well, no, no, no. Wait a minute. I, don't, I, don't, I, you know, I rather talk about certain things that sure. triggered in my mind. <laughs> it's fine. Because I thought that the nine. Uh, 
judges that we have, that was part of the Constitution, that if we ever want to increase that, there would have to be an amendment to the Constitution. Thank you for helping me out, because that's what I just have I to get it through the Senate. Okay. That's called packing the court. Okay. So, so then that is not part of that. Mm. Not that it was, so I'm glad you They established the Supreme Court and that, that that would allow Congress to establish a judicial system at the federal level. Right. But it says nothing. Nothing as to how many. how many justices. Now, you so don't want three justices because that's not enough. That's not enough. You don't want 33 because that's right. too many. So nines just became a traditional this number. That traditional so you number. have the... So, okay, so we have the judicial. You have the which, judicial which, branch, which, which basically nine. determines constitutionality of laws. Right. Okay, so we're going to hold that. We're going to have hold laws up against the Constitution. That's the judicial branch. Because we're a nation of laws, not men. The legislative branch, Congress, passes the laws. That's right. The executive branch, which is run by the President of the United States, uh, enforces yeah. or implements the laws. Yeah, exactly. So if you wonder why our federal government is so enormous today, as Congress passes more and more laws over time, in order to implement and then manage those, you have to create an enormous bureaucracy. Just think of, uh, think of the days when you used to get a paycheck and there were payroll deductions. Remember those? Yes. So uh, <laughs> there's about 120 million workers in America today. Every two weeks they get paid. And out of every one of those 120 million paychecks, we have to pull some money out, goes into a local account, then it goes into an account that ties to the federal government, then it goes to the federal government, and then they have to account for all of it, which is why the uh, IRS is so enormous. The IRS tax code is 60,000 pages. You need a lot of people to manage all that. To manage all that. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, unemployment. Federal government gets bigger sure. and bigger and bigger. As the Congress passes more and more laws and gets involved with more and more aspects of American life, mm -hmm. it gets bigger by definition. But, like, Congress can pass a law, but the president can veto it. Congress can turn around if there's enough people of one party or the other, and they can override the president's veto. The president, to your point, can pick people to be on the Supreme Court, but it has to be approved by the Senate. By the Senate. Any laws that get passed, if they get pushed through the legal system and get to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court can say, no, that's not constitutional, they can strike down the law. So there's all this tension between the three branches, which is what it was designed to do. It's brilliant. Let's talk about executive orders. Um, I am... I don't have full knowledge of it, but the way I see it is that if Congress doesn't pass something, therefore the president can say, well, I'm going to write an executive order doing this, and it goes through. I mean, that's, in my simple mind, that's the way I understand mm -hmm. it. Please give me your side of that. The executive order has the force of law without being a law. Okay, the and force so of law without, without being, being a law. law. So the, the president cannot pass a law. Right. That's unconstitutional. That's exactly. Only Congress can do right. it. But you have to, over the years, enable the president to operate. So he doesn't, in order to do everything that the executive branch has to do, do you want him to run down to Congress every other day and ask their permission to do something? That's right. It's not functional. That mm -hmm. doesn't work. So they created the executive order. Right. Executive orders and things that the president does within the United States. Executive agreements the president can do with heads of other nations. So Biden can do an executive agree agreement with the president of Iran, mm -hmm. Iran tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a treaty. It's just an agreement. Mm -hmm. But the presidency is so powerful now that it kind of acts like a law okay. or a treaty without it being one. Right. The problem there is there is no oversight. The president just does it. He just signs the executive order. We do things like that with abortion. There's all kinds of issues that presidents will flip back and forth depending on whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. That's a, a conversation for another day, but that's a great example of how the power of the executive branch has grown, and I would say to a point now is a problem. It's right. so powerful. However, anytime there's a new administration comes in, they can rescind that executive every order, single right? one, mm -hmm. right. and they do. So, <laughs> so you'll 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 hate executive orders when the current president is of the opposite party. You generally will like executive orders when the president's in your party, and that's where one of the things I'll do 
is press everybody, listeners, viewers, you, her, I'll press everybody on their intellectual honesty. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? An old saying. If, if you have a problem with it in general, you should have a problem with it all the time. Not depending on who's swinging the bat. If it's you versus me, we can talk about our differences or we can talk about the power. So that's one of our biggest problems in this country is we, we gauge what the government is doing based on who's in control. So you complain when it's the other party and you applaud when it's your party. I try to set all of that aside here in the radio or in my classes and just, what does this say? Call balls and strikes in America based on the Constitution and it shouldn't matter whether the president's Joe Biden or Donald Trump. That's why you gotta know this. It's like the Apostle Paul. If, if, you, don't, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. Exactly. Please, let's say that again, please. If you don't know your rights, functionally, you don't have any. Because you don't know whether some, you don't know what you don't know. So you don't know whether something's being taken away from you. You don't know if you're being abused or not. So if you don't really know your rights as an American citizen enshrined in the Constitution of the United States, then you're going to be easily led astray and abused, which is also part of the history of this country. So as a takeaway, what are the things in the Constitution, besides me trying to memorize 27 articles, <laughs> uh, that I should be most aware of as an American? I would point you, before I would point you to the guts of the Constitution, I would point you to the Bill of Rights, the, especially the first 10 amendments. But understanding the Bill of Rights, you begin to understand, like COVID, for example, uh, how far can the government go in a medical emergency? Can the government uh, sh legally, based on this, based on the US Constitution, can a government shut down a church? Constitutionally. Does the government have a right to curtail or shut down the religious observance of any American? Based on that, they don't. it does not. It don't. So a pandemic, COVID, Spanish flu, whatever, doesn't suspend the U.S. Constitution. That's the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution, which means the U.S. Constitution is supreme over everything else in the country. Right. This, it, these are the rules of the road. They're not negotiable. You can change them. We've changed them 27 times. But that's not an easy process. Uh, and it doesn't, it shouldn't be easy because there's a Republican or because there's a Democrat in the White House. Okay? Right. So the government literally had no right to shut down a single church, no matter how bad the health situation was or the pandemic. Right. Now, I can understand where people would have a problem with that. But if you live in the United States of America, and we live in a country that's the rule of law, that's the law, the Constitution. So they had no right to do it. Here in North Carolina, they shut down all the churches, right? There's one pastor. It's about 10,000 churches in North Carolina. There's one pastor, a guy named Ron Beatty, out of near Winston-Salem, who sued. He sued the North Carolina governor for abridging his church's constitutional rights to gather freedom of assembly and to worship freedom of religion, free exercise. And the day he sued and they went to court, he won. And that afternoon, the governor of North Carolina had to come out and say, we can't shut your churches down legally. That's a violation of the U.S. Constitution. But only one pastor, one pastor had, was, the guts uh, had the guts to, to stand up and say, mm. this is wrong, right. and I'll see you in court. Which, by yeah. the way, since both of you and I are believers, followers of Christ, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. At one point, the Apostle Paul wanted to go to Rome. And at one point, he did. He's being beaten again, and he, knowing his rights, basically raises his hand and says, uh, I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. That's right. Which then all the Roman guards, to under up. the force of law, <laughs> had to protect Paul and take him into custody. That's right. Which is then he appeals to Caesar. So he went through Festus, he went through Felix, and that's how he eventually got to Rome. Mm -hmm. But Paul, a Christian, knew his rights and at the right time right. took advantage of them. So. Um, so food for thought perhaps this, in, this was in the video that you were planning to look at on uh, Life with Carlos but just remember that you got to know your rights and stand up 
for what you know is right. Many of us rather just stay in the background. I'm one of those people at times. And just not be embarrassed or be laughed at. Uh, just to keep on going with whatever everybody is doing. But then like this pastor from Winston-Salem that stood up and said, my rights to assemble and my right to worship are being violated by this right here. And he got it. So, is there anything else you want to say before we close? I would add one thing that's not in there. Okay. That if you call yourself a Christian, and not if you call yourself a Christian, uh, I would go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 which commands Christians everywhere to pray for those in authority over you so that you can live a quiet and peaceable life. If you want some help with that, uh, there's a website. It's pray one tim Make sure you put this on the screen, Elena. pray one tim org. pray one tim like as in 1 Timothy, uh -huh. one tim org. You'll see a map. Uh -huh. You'll pick your state. Okay. And then you'll sign up for an email every day that will send you six or seven members of your state legislature, mm -hmm. state as well as on the federal level, well, that's to pray for. Okay. And well, maybe one of the reasons we've had so many problems in this country for years is because the vast majority of Christians almost never pray for those in authority over you. We'll pray for them if I voted for them. But the scripture doesn't say that. <laughs> Scripture says pray for those in authority over you. All of those, yeah, it's true. So when you like go to that website, and I've been getting that prayer list every day for probably eight years now, uh, it doesn't tell you what party they're in. It doesn't tell you whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. Because for me, that might taint how I pray, which is sad but true. And so it just shows me. Pray for those in authority over you. Thank uh, you. If you love Biden, you better pray for him. If you can't stand for Biden, you better pray for him. Right, left. Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, pray for them. They need to pray for all of them. Because once you understand this, and then once you understand how difficult it is to govern a nation like ours, you, you'll realize why God told us we need to pray for those people. Plus, for us as Christians, it then helps to allow us to live a quiet and peaceable life, which is what most of us want. Exactly. Exactly. There you have it. Um, I just want to close by... Um, by saying that uh, this was not, um, when I first started my videos, that this was going to be part of uh, talking about the Constitution and government and that. And, but it is something very important to all of us. And if you have any questions, like I said at the beginning, any questions or comments, uh, please let me know because and if there's any subject out there that you would like for, for me to uh, do another show on, uh, please let me know. I would appreciate that very much. So I want to thank Steve. You're welcome. For his time. My pleasure. And his knowledge. Uh, I learned some things here. And so with that, would you help me go like I this, sure please? Goodbye. Perfect. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to get a little book like that, they can just go to Amazon. Heritage, or Heritage or Foundation or does it. I don't, yeah. know, I don't know where yeah. this one came from. They can go and, and I used to buy boxes. Yep. Yeah.